concluding our series called The Big Picture. And in this series, we've tried to take step backs and, and we've gone through some of these Genesis uh, narratives, these narratives that were at the very beginning to help us to, to realize that maybe some of the things that God was doing at the very beginning, he's continued to do. We've also looked at some of the, the New Testament passages of scripture that allowed us to understand that, that God is still at work and hopefully encourage you that, that God is still at work in many of the same ways that he was at the beginning of time. You know, what, through this series, we've also kind of been putting towards an introspective, a, a theme and this idea, this, this constant thing that, that in our brokenness, sometimes we look at our sin, we look at our brokenness, we look at it and we feel like, you know, we're maybe we're unworthy, we, we don't really belong, we're, we're not connected, but be reminded that God is working in the midst of brokenness. He, he's not surprised by, by our sin or our, our hurt or our, our our missteps. Instead, he's a God that prom promises and provides compassion and grace and mercy. And in fact, he, he holds back his wrath so that we might come to him. So we, we, might, we might join with him. We might experience him. And so today, as, as we close, uh, I want to look at something that's been kind of a vein through all the stories. I know we saw Adam and Eve and, and Cain and Abel we, we see these, these early characteristics of humanity in which selfishness rules, pride is there. And in today's uh, narration that you'll go through in your small group, and, and we'll look at it just briefly in here, we see some of the same things happen with humanity. And God still chooses to be with us. He still chooses to, to come to us. He still chooses to allow us to to fail and at the same time allow us to come back to him. I'm gracious of that. I'm, excuse me, I'm grateful for his graciousness. I, I'm so thankful that God forgives me. I know that I absolutely need his forgiveness. I need it and, and I so much appreciate the prayers that we had during our Lord's Supper to remind us that we're thankful for what God has done, that he has forgiven us of our sins and our wrongdoings. In today's passage, it's in Genesis, Genesis chapter one, and you'll look at that. Those of you who are joining small group, those of you who are not gonna be in small group today, you can take one of those cards and look at some of these scriptures at home or over lunch. But in Genesis chapter 11, you have this story that, that we all probably know, the Tower of Babel. Even if you don't grow up in church, many of us are familiar with that story through either some historical narrative or maybe you've heard about it through college or something because very, the early, early writings that we have from a lot of different countries and ethnicities, historical, all talk about this time period when, when humanity was at its grand peak for the Mayan civilization, right? They have these wonderful Mayan architecture and you see this in, in Chile and you see it in Africa and you, you see it in, in Europe and you see everywhere where these civilizations grew up out of seemingly nothing, yet they were able to massive marvelous feats. Those of you probably seen the, the pyramids. There's something about how these, these early peoples were able to do stuff that defies our own understanding without technology that we have today, without machinery, they were able to do some great things. The Tower of Babel records a time when, when the people are out of the great flood. And the, the generations from Noah are, are, are these three sons and these three sons begin to populate the earth again. And one of those generations, one of those lines leads to a great grandson of Noah named Nimrod. And Nimrod settles in an area of the Cigar Valley and he settles into this area and he, he, he begins with his power and his might to assemble people and, and begins to, with their language, their shared language, build a huge tower, a huge residence for the people, a, a huge place that, 
that everybody can go. Maybe you've seen similar architecture in books like the ziggurats, these shelved pyramid type structures. In chapter 11, it says, the whole earth had the same language and vocabulary. As people migrated from the east, they found a valley in the land of Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come let us make oven fired bricks. They used brick for stone and asphalt for mortar. They said, come let us build ourselves a city and a tower. With its top in the sky, let us make the, a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered throughout the earth. And interesting, these people and, and these descendants of Noah, these, these uh, people who are assembled and, and I believe connected to, to Nimrod and his power and his strength here, they decide to make a name for themselves. They decide to protect themselves, to provide provision for themselves. And, and that is the inherent issue, isn't it? All of us at some level have this tension in which we believe we are to care for ourselves, to, to take care of ourselves, provide for ourselves, to make a name for ourselves. I, I mean, at, at some level, the use of social media is really not about social, but more about projection. Not about interaction with one another, but, but to show and, and to make a name for ourselves. It's just another iteration of the Tower of Babel. It's just another way in which we have been, from the very beginning, humanity, striving to see that our own desires are what is met. And what's interesting when humanity is left to its own devices, for instance, in the book of Judges, when everybody is doing what is right in their own eyes, or for instance, what is happening here in America and all over the world, when everybody tends to do what is best for themselves, we don't ever end up with a great product. In fact, we end up with Destruction, ultimately. Because what began to be toleration soon turns into totalitarian. Where one person is trying to conquer the other person and one person's power and authority and might is trying to win out. And ultimately, our pursuits for self are just another way to find destruction. Now, it's easy as I say that for us to go, oh yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. You know, and push it away and, and consider that the tension that is in with the self is about what they do. But what about us? Where have you seen your own selfishness, your own desires for making your own stuff greater, your own protection of even just your own family get in the way or hurt or harm ultimately? You know what happens? Sometimes it happens oh so slightly where our tendencies to care and protect soon begin to hoard. Those of you who are alive a few years ago, you probably remember there was no toilet paper available. Isn't that silly? I mean, to think that one's own desire for self and self-preservation stored thousands of rolls of toilet paper, keeping other people from getting toilet paper. Am I the only person that saw that as silly? If you saw that as silly too, you say, yeah. Yeah. But didn't you buy yourself too much toilet paper? You did. I did. I don't even know why I bought that much toilet paper. You go to Sam's and one time they were letting you buy whatever you want. The next time you come in, they're like, you could only get one. Eventually they were like, you can just tear off one sheet and take it, right? And you're like, what is this gonna do? 
But there's something in humanity that we, we think it's just, we think it's just the rulers. We think it's just like, like Putin and, and other rulers who are coming over or, or the, the people in charge of, of the West, the Middle East. And we think, oh my goodness, you know, they're, they're the ones that are trying to take over. They're the ones that are trying to do it. But, but realistically, when we get back to it, when we're given our own areas and we start seeing scarcity, we will get all of our own stuff too to protect and to provide. Even for something as silly as toilet paper. And all that does is lead to destruction. And what we see here is that in this Tower of Babel, they're saying that, that we are going to do this. We are going to conquer. The problem is they have already forgotten that God is the one who provides. They've already forgotten that God is the one who sustains and God is the one who gives the mission. They've already forgotten that. And they are only two generations away from the flood. Parents, grandparents, sometimes we think that our kids won't repeat our same mistakes or, or as you've heard it said, generational curse. We think that's not gonna happen. But the truth of the matter is that, that every human is going to do these things that humans do, which is to take and collect for themselves and, and place their own desires over everyone else's, their own, own protection and preservation and self-preservation over everyone else's. It doesn't matter what line or generation you fall. All of us do, unless we make a decision. We make a decision to believe there is a God who has something better for us. It's interesting what God does here and he disturbs them and, and he, he breaks them up. He gives them different languages. And that's the, the, the Genesis telling of all the languages and how they spread. But if we look at the historical record after that, we see that even these la languages, all different, still created great things. They still drove and we still see that, that, that people conquered nations and destroyed people and others for their own desires. So even though these people receive that consequence of breaking up in different languages and not able to communicate and not able to work together anymore as a repression of faith, we see that the human issue of self-reliance and our own pursuits and our own desires and our own thinking that we can do it better ourselves is opposite of what God has declared as what he's able to do when we work with him when he works through us. A lot of the struggle, a lot of the struggle there is not really seeing that God is making us new. I want you to turn over to Romans, passage that we've looked at the last couple of weeks. Romans chapter six, some of you know, we've looked at Romans eight and Romans five, and, and we looked at those, and there's a passage in Romans six, It's kind of interesting. And Paul, as he talks about this passage, he kind of pokes at us a little bit. He, he pokes at us a little bit as he, as he writes this letter to, the, to these Romans and, and he starts off with verse one. It says, what should we say then? Should we continue to sin so that grace may multiply? Now, in the, the context of this, he, he is already taking everybody back to the, to the beginning. And he's saying that in, in Adam, Adam is this original sin. And so we need someone who's going to be the original savior, which is Jesus. And, and we have this issue that sin is continuing to multiply. But then there's people who gain this freedom because God has saved us. And we think now we have a carte blanche way of living. We can do whatever we want, whenever we want. We talked about this in our student ministry last week. This idea that, that we, can, we can sin and keep on sinning, it's okay. And Paul starts off in verse one of chapter six, says, what should we say then? Should we continue to sin so that grace can multiply? And in verse two, it says, absolutely not. How can we die to sin and still live in it? I wanna use that as this setup here because there's this idea that we, if you believe in Jesus Christ, have already said that Jesus is the Savior and Lord 
of our life. If Jesus is the Savior and Lord of our life, then that makes me not the Savior and Lord of my life, not the master of my decisions. And yet, the struggle I have every day is getting up and deciding who's gonna direct my path. Will it be me or will it be God? My morning devotional this morning was this very thing. It's a constant with all of us because inside of all of us at the deepest roots of sin is this idea that we can take care of ourselves. We've got it. We only need God when we're in complete in trouble. And I want you to know, if we've made God our savior, if, if he've said that, that he has saved us from sin, and we have said we're dead in it, then the, this huge sin, this sin of self-reliance, this sin of selfishness, this sin of I am the, my own master has to be the very thing that we must put to death every week, every day, every hour. If you continue to read through this in verse three, it says, or are you unaware that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Paul making this, this analogy, this, this connection that, that our baptism, this, this symbol of death and then coming up to new life, that was a real thing that when we, when we decided to follow Jesus and we were baptized, we were participating in the death that, that this stuff, this sin, this flesh, this, this selfishness, we're, we're giving that over to death. And then he clarifies that statement even more in verse four. You'll see this on the screen. This is an important one. Therefore, we were buried with him in baptism unto death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness of life. The bigger picture here is that God wants to be our God. God wants to be the master of our lives. And he wants to do great things in us and through us and empower us. And in fact, most of what we see you in the workings of the Holy Spirit and the workings of the, 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 the gifts of the Spirit that are given to us are all about us working with one another so that we can do the great things that God has called us to. But the core, there's a resistance to those things. Instead, we'd rather do them ourselves. And just like the Tower of Babel, if we use this for ourselves only, it will only lead to destruction. It will only lead to hurt. It will only lead to some of these things. It will only lead to you having an entire shelf of toilet paper that you're still going through two years later. Because we hoard. And when we do that, and when we, we take it on ourselves and we try to protect ourselves, what are we actually doing? We're hurting the community. We're keeping from, in fact, when we look at the very beginning of the church in Acts, what we see is that, that they, were, they were rich and, and they were poor and there were, were people who were, were slaves and there were people who were slave owners and they got all together and they pooled their goods and they said, you know what? We're going to take care of one another because this is what God has called us to, this greater work. And since then, the church has struggled with that. You struggle with it. I struggle with it. So you want me to give my money and you want me to give my time to help take care of a bunch of people who I really don't want to live with? That's community? You want me to take an hour of my day to go help provide a meal to a family who I rarely know? You want me to eat every week in, in, a, in a building that, that needs more air conditioning? Right? You, you want me to do that? And, and then you want me to also serve these people who I'm with? 
with my own stuff? Oh, pastor, I'm okay. I'm just gonna come, hang out, and I'm gonna go home. But when we start to see a different perspective, that we've laid to death that sin of selfishness and self-centeredness. We're putting to death that, 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 that self-reliance and that self-independence. We're, we're laying that down and we're saying that American dream is not really what we're called to be when we're doing that. And we're saying we're gonna be more communal and we're gonna be more fellowship oriented and we're gonna be more caretaking oriented for one another. <clears throat> When we say that we're going to love one another like Christ Jesus loved us and we start doing that, we allow for the opening of the Holy Spirit to dwell in us and work in us and do something much greater than we could do on our own. And I'm just wondering, I'm wondering what great thing God has in store for you and for me, and for Parkwood, when we begin to realize that there's a newness to this life where I'm not really trying to just make a name for myself, but I'm actually trying to make a name for God. And I'm actually not just trying to take care of myself so that I'll be better, but I'm actually trying to take care of others. When that year we had COVID and everybody was collecting toilet paper, we decided we would give toilet paper to all the, the families that we visited to deliver Easter egg to. Just as a reminder, and you know whose toilet paper we took? The ones you paid for in this building. Those who gave their tithes and offerings, and we thought, you know what? No one's coming in here. And we, we gave it all the way. And there was, there was one person in our meeting that was like, you know what? Well, if we give all this toilet paper away and there's no toilet paper, what if when we open back up? What, how are we gonna be able to have toilet paper? And I thought, does it really matter? We'll get those people who took it all and have them bring it back to church. But we, we just wanted this image to come back to say, look, you know, while the whole world is saying, mine, 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 this is what I need, I need to protect. We are going to say, you know what? It's not about what we're preserving here, but it's about what God can do through us when we care for other people. That is a mentality that changes the world. And we've all seen it. We've seen it in Mother Teresa. We've seen it in Nelson Mandela. We've seen it in, in those who are serving in the midst of the hardest areas of this world. We've seen it in our own missionaries. When someone says, I'm gonna deny myself and I'm gonna see what God can do through me. Here's what I wonder, church. I wonder if we really believe that God can do something better through us than we can do for ourselves. What would it take for you to believe that God can do this new work, this newness of life, if you just take and push that old and, and give away and realize that we died to that self, we died to that sin, we died to that, and now I'm living this new life, what would it take for you to believe that God can do something more and better through you than you or I can do for ourselves. What would it take? At the core of it, it takes a step of faith and it takes an act of obedience. And for some of us, for us to finally see the bigger picture, it's gonna take us doing something together. Giving of our time, giving of our talents, giving of our finances, going to someone and serving them, caring for someone. Some act of faith and obedience that we can see where God is pulling us and pursuing us to move and we just say yes. And we do it because we believe that we've pushed this old life behind us, 
that God has dead and buried that. And the life that is standing before you now is a new life empowered by the the scriptures, empowered by the Holy Spirit and fueled by the body and the blood of Jesus Christ that has died for my sins. I want to live and work in a church and a community like that. That believes that the steps that we're taking are on faith. Believe that that what God is doing through all of us, surrendered to his plan is better and what we could do for ourselves. I have no desire to build a tower of Babel, a a tower that takes us to nowhere that that is ultimately gonna lead to destruction. I have no desire to build a place that lifts up the voice of humankind when we can pull ourselves together to make sure that our voice echoes the words of God. In a few weeks, we're gonna celebrate. You saw it up on the screen for the first time. You'll see it on social media. We're gonna have all of our churches to year together in a few weeks to, to celebrate and to worship. And we're gonna hear different languages and we're gonna hear different things and we're gonna worship in, in one voice. I want you to see, and I want you to invite your friends and your family to come because I want you to see what happens when a church really decides that we're gonna walk in a new way, a way in which we're, we're taking what we have so that the word and the name of God can get out to as many people as possible. You will be amazed. You'll be amazed because you will get to see what God's doing through you and your gifts and your sacrifice and your time. And we'll get to celebrate that. And afterwards, we're gonna eat a meal together. And I wanna encourage you to try the food that you don't like. I tell that to my son all the time, try it. You'll never know you like it, right? Bring food that you do like, just in case you don't see anything you like, right? We'll eat together. And then this week, as you're tempted to, to secure for yourself your own foundation, your own platform, your own whatever, ask yourself, How can I die to that and live this new life in Christ and then make a different decision? Stand with me. I'm gonna close this out in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I come before you and I thank you. I thank you for this day and I thank you for this life. And Father, I pray that you would help us to live out our calling, to help us to see that you are a God who loves us, who cares for us, Lord, that you've already had us bury our old life. Father, help us to walk in this new life. Help us to walk in a life that is worthy of the debt that you've paid. And Father, wherever we go, let us proclaim your death, for that is victory. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.